pastoral Dan and his wife. She frequently visits their house and spends some time to calm herself down. There were instances wherein H.A. expressed that she is already tired of doing everything in the house, and she expressed her frustration of not being able to enjoy her retirement and desired to relax and enjoy the rest of her days because she was not getting any younger. The current household is composed of the patient, H.A., Robert, and his living partner, Cheryl, who are both um, unemployed at present, and um, uh, the couple's three young children, aged two and four years old. For the personal and social history, H.A. grew up with her parents and siblings in Cebu, and she was the fourth of eight children, and her mother was the primary caretaker of the children while, while her father worked in the farm. Growing up, H.A. had a closer relationship to her mother and described her family to be close-knit. Although her parents struggled to make ends meet, they tried their best to provide for their children. Her parents did not employ corporal punishment, but instead used verbal reprimand to discipline H.A. and her siblings. She started first grade at seven years old, and she had average, uh, average grades in school and had no difficulty socializing with her peers. According to H.A., it took her and her siblings at least three hours to get to school, which meant that they needed to, needed to wake up very early and often arrived home late. She only finished up to fourth grade because walking to and from school became part tiresome for her. Instead, she opted to help her mother in taking care of her younger siblings and also helped her father out in their farm at times. H.A. spent most of her teenage years helping her mother and father in taking care of her younger siblings. Her mother taught her how to do household chores and instilled in H.A. the importance of having a loving family. She remembered her mother saying, Bahala na uglisod basta ang importante malayo ng pamilya. She took this to heart and acknowledged that she lived by the advice of her mother when she had a family of her own. When she was 18 years old, her younger sibling went, to, um, went with their aunt to Davao City. She worked in a carinderia for a few months but quit because of the long working hours became unbearable for her. H.A. then worked as a house helper and it was during this time that she met her husband. She got pregnant and got married less, less than a year into the relationship. And after marrying, H.A. decided to stay at home to supposedly take care of her baby while her husband continued to work as a heavy equipment driver. Unfortunately, H.A. lost her first baby during her eighth month of pregnancy. She denied having any maternal illness at that time and was sad about her baby's death. The couple was there for each other during this difficult time and her husband's support helped H.A. to recover from their loss. Within the year, she again became pregnant. However, the second baby died 15 days after being born due to seizures. H.A. was unable to explain the exact cause of their second child's death, but claimed that she did not suffer from any medical illness while pregnant. H.A. grieved the loss of her two children. She questioned her ability to become a mother, and according to her sister, the couple's devotion to each other greatly helped H.A. through the loss of her two babies. So the couple decided to take in H.A.'s younger sister to help her uh, to accompany H.A. and also help the younger sister through school until she was able to finish college. Um, H.A. became pregnant for the third time on the couple's fourth year of marriage. This time, the baby was born alive and well, and so were her fourth to eighth children. H.A. and her late husband had a harmonious relationship. Apart from the occasional arguments, they help each other in raising their children, and she was also and she was also a loving and caring mother to her children. So she made sure that her children's needs were taken care of. When her husband retired from driving in 2005, the couple relied on his pension of three to four thousand per month for their day-to-day -day expenses. To earn extra income, H.A. started working as a store clerk in their barangay cooperative. She was happy to take on the job because aside from the income, she was, um, it was also a way for her to socialize with other people in the neighborhood. Aside from working in the cooperative, H.A. was also busy taking care of her husband and her unmarried children. She was still the one who cleans the house 
and cook for the, everyone because her children were preoccupied with work. She did not want to burden her husband because the latter was already hypertensive. H.A. did not mind being, uh, doing this because she loved her fami family and for her, it was her role as a wife and mother to do this. H.A.'s husband died in 2010 due to cardiac arrest. Losing her husband was hard for H.A., but the company of her children and grandchildren provided her with much needed support. According to her children, H.A. would still recall memories with her late husband and verbalize that she missed him but was able to continue with her daily activities and work in the barangay cooperative. After her husband's death, H.A. was left with her youngest son, Robert, and his live-in partner, who continued to live in the couple's house in, within the compound. Among her children, Robert was the uh, most troublesome and least successful one. He was often in between jobs as a construction worker, and his live-in partner, on the other hand, was also had also difficulties finding a stable employment. On top of this, the, the couple frequently lost mon money to gambling, and HA helps them financially most of the time using the pension left by her late husband, her income from the cooperative, and the money sent by her son, who was working abroad. Aside from financial assistance, HA was also the one who does household chores and helps in taking care of the couple's children. The couple's gambling frustrated H.A. and she would confront the couple about it. This resulted to several arguments between H.A. and the couple and ultimately strained the relationship. However, H.A. still continued to help the couple because she cannot bear to see her son suffer. She was diagnosed to have hypertension four years ago, prompting her children to convince her to retire from her job in the cooperative. H.A. obliged and kept herself busy by doing house chores for Robert and taking care of her grandchildren. She even prepares food for Robert daily for him to bring to work because she wants to make sure that Robert was not, uh, was, will not be hungry. Despite her strained relationship with Robert, H.A. continued to allow the couple to live in her house, to do household chores for them, and even help in taking care of their uh, young children. As described by her daughter-in-law, it, it was as if that um, H.A. was their house helper. Prior to the onset of symptoms, H.A. was able to do basic and instrumental activities of daily living independently. She had no specific food preference and her diet composed mainly of vegetables, vegetable dishes with some meat. She is also able to chew her food well. H.A. had no history of being arrested or being deployed in the military. She was only fin uh, able to finish up to fourth grade. She is a Roman Catholic and she claimed to believe in a greater being, but admits seldom going to church because she was busy taking care of her children and doing household chores. She identifies herself as a female and, and is interested in the opposite sex, and her husband was her first and only partner. H.A. had always lived by her mother's words and aspired to be a good mother to her, to her children and a good wife to her husband. Her definition of happiness is being able to care, care for her family and make them happy. The, um, the, the, uh, the patient denied any substance and illicit drug use and there was no history of gambling. So before we proceed to the mental status exam, Doc, are, are there any questions at this point? About cafe news, Davy. Cafe news. Cafe news. Um, she does not drink coffee, po, doc. She prefers milk, doc. For the history at this point, um, was there any other um corroborative history that you were able to gather regarding the treatment of um the the the, the daughter in law and the and the son, tama, no? Yes, po, Doc. It's Robert uh, and Cher Cherry, ba yun? Cheryl, Doc. So, uh, Cheryl. actually, Doc, for the first um, encounter with the patient, she was accompanied by her granddaughter, I, by her daughter-in-law. So, primarily, for the first consult, my source of information was the daughter-in-law, her husband, who later um, came in, and um, the patient, Doc, actually, the patient is able to um, say or verbalize, answer some questions regarding to the alleged treatment. Mm, okay. Uh, 
But uh, will you be discussing, were you able to get other sources later on? Yes po, Doc. Yes po, Doc. Um, in uh, the second consult, Doc, the granddaughter was able to come with the patient. And okay. also, Doc, um, since there is an alleged history of abuse, as, as um, said earlier, it was part of our of my of our management to refer this patient to social services for a welfare visit. And actually, doc, just um, their um, social case study. We asked, we requested for a social case study report, and they were they were able to submit um, two days ago. Lang. Okay, okay. Uh, you will be discussing this later on. Yes, for doc. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sige, later on na lang ako magtatanong. Yes. Morning. Ask ko lang, Dave. Yes, um, uh, in your history, uh, based on your objective also, that there yes, is an abuse. You mean yes, it's not a physical abuse, it's more of, of emotional, psychological yes. abuse because of uh, domesticate, domesticated siya? Ganun ba yun? Yes, Doc. At this point, Doc, um, during the first consult, it was still um, emotional, psychological abuse and um, some financial abuse po, Doc, since the elder, uh, the patient who's an elderly was primarily the provider for the household. Mm-hmm. But she still lived with her, her son despite of all this uh, abuse. Yes, Doc. She um, endured it, po, Doc. And actually, Doc, um, uh, the, the younger son was the one who, parang, she, he stayed. He was the one who stayed in HA's house because the, she he had no means to um uh, to pay for his own um housing for dog so um he stayed with his mother mm-hmm. but but the couple the the son uh, yes. Robert who is yes. a gambler and and I think uh she yung nag ano uh very dependent on yes, po, he on was his very mother. dependent though, on the on his mother though, financially and in terms of doing um household chores it uh, they greatly relied on ha mm-hmm. for the patient oh, okay thank you yes sir. so um can i proceed for the mental status exam the patient was seen well groomed wearing a white t-shirt and painted pajamas, and she looked appropriate for her chronological age. She had an ectomorphic body type and looked frail. She was lightly restless and poorly cooperative during the interview, and she kept on standing up because she was worried that she might need to pay more if the interview lasted longer. There was also noted psychomotor retardation, and uh, she was noted to have a slouched posture. She kept on looking down and had, had poor eye contact. The patient was anxious and expressed that she was worried because she she isn't able to do anything because um, uh, she will just be hurt. Kulatahon lang ko. And uh, she displayed appropriate affect. The patient was noted to have mixed insomnia. She often uh, goes to bed, lies down to go to bed at 8 o'clock in the evening, but had trouble maintaining, a, maintaining sleep throughout the night. She usually wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning and sometimes starts doing household chores because she isn't able to go back to sleep already. And um, she has a decreased appetite. Patient was noted to be more anxious in the morning, especially when she hears the voice of her son's living partner. Also, there was a noted decrease in interest in doing household chores because um, she felt more tired than usual. And um, she also had decreased uh, interest in doing activities of daily living. Also, the patient display, uh, had poor attention. The patient spoke in a whispered voice and gave deliberate answers to the interview questions. There was also noted increased latency between, interview, be, between the interview question and her answer. The patient claimed to have auditory hallucinations and she claims to hear a woman saying, Gidakup na, gidakup na. But, was, uh, but she refused to elaborate on this and she also refused to identify whose voice it was. The patient was able to, gi- able to give appropriate answers to questions, 
However, there were times that she was, uh, she appeared hesitant. And um, there were also instances where in the patient gave tangential and circumstantial answers. The patient was able, was, sorry, um, there were no looseness of associations, light of ideas, and other um, impairment in thought process. There was persecutory delusion, and the patient kept on saying that she will be arrested by the police. However, when asked to elaborate on what her offense might be, um, she, she, she is unable to, to say or to tell. She was also noted to repeatedly say that she, she has seen and she, should, and she will be hurt. And she is afraid because um, they will hurt her. There was hopelessness and passive suicidal ideation. And the patient verbalized that she wants to um, die because she, uh, so that she will be able to rest. But um, she was also worried that her children might become estranged from each other if she died. The patient was oriented to time, person, and self, but not to place. Memory evaluation showed impaired recent memory as evidenced by patient's inability to recall after five minutes, the, five minutes the three things she was asked to remember. As for the immediate recall, it was not assessed because the patient was uncooperative. She refused to do serial subtraction because according to her, she does not know how to subtract. But as said earlier, prior to the onset of symptoms, patient was able to work in their barangay cooperative, giving change to customers as well as managing her own finances. She also refused to spell the word Pasco because according to her, she is afraid to commit an error. Patient was unable to tell the, the similarity between an airplane and a ship and also was unable to do proverb interpretation. There was adequate fund of knowledge. Please clarify, David. Yes, but doc. The information, sorry, um, abstract in the abstract thinking. Yes, uh, abstract. Parang iba yata yung narinig ko from the slide. She was able to. to she was able to tell the difference, Doc, okay. but unable to tell the similarities. Ah, okay, okay. About. Noted. And thank she, you. She was unable to do uh, proper interpretation. Okay, thank you. Uh, she had impaired social and test judgment, and the patient has no insight into her condition, and she sees the interview as a means for her to go to prison. For the physical examination, patient had elevated BP and the rest of the vital signs were normal. She has um, this uh, PE for skin and nails was unremarkable except for the patient's saggy skin, which, which can be considered appropriate for her age. Um, other physical examination findings were unremarkable. For the neurologic examination, uh, the patient was uncooperative to um, smelling coffee uh, but the rest of the uh, of the uh, neurologic evaluation was unremarkable also uh, motor reflex motor and deep tendon reflexes were normal and she is right-handed although she refused to write um, it was noted that when she was uh, asked to write she used her right hand to pick up the pen for the psychiatric review of symptoms, um, the patient pre uh, presented with periods of being sad, decreased interest in usual activities, feeling down, excessive guilt, feeling more tired than usual, trouble concentrating, suicidal ideations, trouble sleeping, and refusal to eat. There were no symptoms of mania noted, and there was presence of um, persecutory delusion and auditory hallucinations. Um, there was noted frequent worrying and being afraid to go out of, go out of the house, but this was related to her belief that police are coming to arrest her. There were no panic attacks noted. There were problems with complex attention, so normal tasks took longer than usual, and there were also noted errors in routine tasks. There was also impairment in executive function. There was, there was forgetfulness and trouble concentrating. For the functional assessment, so I used the CATS index of independence in daily activities of daily living scale. And um, it is usually the instrument used to assess functional status as a measure of the client's ability to perform activities of daily living. So um, these are the activities that are rated. So before 
prior to onset of the symptom, the patient was fully functional. And upon consultation, um, there was noted moderate impairment, especially in the ability to uh, feed herself, to bathe herself, to dress herself. So the um, Lawton Brod Brody instrumental activities of daily living scale was used to assess the patient's ability to do IADLs. So IADLs are considered more complex than the ADLs. And uh, this instrument is useful for identifying how a person is functioning at the present time and to identify improvement or deterioration over time. So using this scale, prior to um, the symptom, the AV. onset of symptoms, yes, Doc? Um, ang question ko is, uh, what made you decide to use this scale for to assess the functioning of the patient? Okay. Doc, um, because uh, according to the, uh, the studies I have read, po, doc, these are um, easy to use. It's fast uh, because, of the, because it is short. So it's easy to use and easy to administer and also has a good reliability and sensitivity. Po, doc. And um, it can be easily used to uh, assess functionality over time. So you could, you could compare it and administer it through, uh, um, during different times and monitor the patient's functionality. Po, doc. Uh, what other functional assessment tests can you do? Um, there is the... Ano, doc? Yung, pwede doc, yung GAF, Global Assessment of Functioning. What else? Uh, um, um, so familiarize yourselves with other skills. Although, yun nga, ha? You, can't, you may use this one. Um, but you, you may uh, also look into other scales that can also help you uh, maybe because the scoring ba? You, the, oh. the scoring might might be better if it's on a uh, Likert scale. Mm, okay, po, so you would be able to see also kung um yung, yung decrease ng functioning throughout time. Although oh. yun nga, you can use this one. Not but one. familiarize yourselves with the other ones as well. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you for doc. So for the uh, ability to do instrumental activities of daily living, um, prior to symptom on onset, the patient was highly functional and independent. However, upon consultation, there was low function and the uh, high dependency. Uh, there was impairment in ability to use the telephone, shopping, food preparation, uh, doing her own laundry, um, going from one place to another. Um, managing her own medications and ability to handle finances. For the initial impression of this patient, um, it was considered uh, that the patient had major depressive disorder with psychotic features to consider pseudodementia of depression versus major neurocognitive disorder, hypertension stage 2 poorly controlled, and status post cataract extraction. The corresponding ICD diagnoses are noted below. For the salient features, so we have a 70-year-old female widow, elementary undergraduate housewife who was known to be hardworking and helpful towards family members. There was a history of verbal and physical abuse from family members, and there was an unidentifiable stressor, her youngest son being hospitalized several times, and she was unable to help. Medical history is significant for hypertension and um, previous cataract extraction surgery, and um, recently, she was given clonazepam with, with a range of, dose range of 0.5 to 1 milligram per day. Psychiatric and affective symptoms, so there were periods of feeling sad, decreased interest in usual activities, feeling down, excessive guilt, feeling more tired than usual, trouble concentrating, suicidal ideations, trouble sleeping, refusal to eat, and feeling, uh, and persecutory delusion, auditory hallucination, which is mood congruent and complex attention problems, impairment in executive function and forgetfulness. For the physical exam, the patient appeared frail and had elevated blood pressure ranging from 130 to 150 over 60 to 80. So for my differential diagnosis, so we are presented with a 70-year-old female who, was, who is widowed who presented in our institution due to depressed mood, disorganized behavior and speech. 
for so for my differentials, I divided the uh, disorders into primary, secondary psychiatric disorders, and primary psychiatric disorders. So first, I would um, I would like to discuss secondary psychiatric disorders. For this case, I consider delirium medication into psychotic disorder and psychotic disorder due to another medical condition. First, for delirium, the patient is at risk for delirium um, due to her age of um, being over 65 years old. Also, there were symptoms of cognitive impairment, there was visual impairment, and possible neurocognitive disorder. So, um, however, this could be ruled out due to the insidious onset and gradual progression of symptoms over nine months, and symptoms are consistently present throughout the day. Although there was impairment on um, memory, language, and visual spatial ability as based on MMSE, the cognitive disturbance could be better explained by another um, disorder. Um, and also, there was no evidence that a uh, history of recent substance use could, uh, that could uh, contribute to developing delirium and uh, normal, there was normal neurologic and PE findings and the laboratory results were within normal limits. Hence, this was ruled out. Also, um, I considered medication-induced psychotics, specifically clonazepam-induced psychotic disorder, because um, there was new onset of psychotic symptoms, which coincided with the, um, with the use of clonazepam. So although it's rare for clonazepam-induced psychotic disorder, um, some studies have shown that giving benzodiazepine in the elderly makes them more prone to developing psychosis. In a case report by White and Silverman, they presented the case of a 73-year-old male with no previous psychiatric history who received clonazepam maintenance therapy for essential blepharospasm. So um, this woman, uh, this patient presented with visual, auditory, and tactile hallucinations as well as paranoid delusions. So psychosis was probably... In this case, the psychosis was probably related to clonazepam-induced increased central, central nervous system serotonin and possible predisposition to organic brain syn syndrome by undocumented causes. However, the occurrence of psychosis is rare and is most com commonly associated with benzodiazepine withdrawal. So also for this case, the patient, uh, the symptoms noted in the patient preceded the onset uh, preceded the use of substance or medication, or, or medication, and the symptoms persisted for a substantial period of time after cessation of clonazepam. And there is other evidence of an independent non-substance medication-induced psychotic disorder. Hence, this was ruled out. So also, psychotic disorder due to another medical condition was considered because of um, her uh, poorly controlled hypertension. So. The occurrence of psychosis in patients with hypertension or other car cardiovascular disease is commonly observed following a cere cerebrovascular accident or stroke. In our patient, however, physical and neurologic examination did not reveal signs of possible CVA. And although there were some reports, such as in the case reported by Bukamala in 2014, wherein they documented uh, his, uh, an episode of psychosis in a 60-year-old male following a hypertensive crisis. So hypertensive psychosis is very rare. And in the case of our patient, the occurrence of psychotic symptoms could be better explained by another psychiatric disorder. Hence, this was ruled out. Next is the primary psychiatric disorder. So for this case, I consider the following disorders. Brief psychotic disorder, delusional disorder, major depressive disorder with psychotic features, and major neurocognitive disorder. So brief psychotic disorder was um, was uh, considered because there was an identifiable identifiable stressor, and the symptoms of uh, auditory hallucination and persecutory delusion and disorganized behavior were continuous for were continuously present for two weeks. However, there was prominent depressive symptoms fulfilling the criteria of MDD, which were noted prior to the onset of psychotic symptoms. Hence, this was ruled out. Delusional disorder was also considered because delusional disorder could be uh, more common in older individuals. And the most common subtype of delusion is persecutory, especially in the elderly. However, in persons aged 60 years old and above, the presence of delusions 
especially paranoid or persecutory type, is more likely to be due to a neurocognitive disorder or a mood disorder. Also, there is marked impairment in, er in um, several areas of functioning. Hence, um, this was ruled out. So for the um, next is major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So the patient is, um, is a female and it has been um, established that depression is more common in females than in males. She's also widowed, which predisposes her to ve developing depression. And also there was noted identifiable stressor. So there was noted depressed mood nearly every day for several months. There was decreased appetite nearly every day and she had difficulty sleeping and noted psychomotor retardation as noted by family members. It was, um, the patient also expressed feeling fatigue and there were noted feelings of worthlessness and excessive guilt. There was also reduced ability to concentrate. Also, sorry. also there was noted functional impairment based on objective rating, rating scales and the account of caregivers. And um, the onset of depressive symptoms preceded the onset of psychotic, psychotic symptoms. Hence, um, and there were also no manic episodes. Hence, um, major depressive disorder with psychotic features cannot be ruled out. So for my last differential diagnosis, I, I considered major neurocognitive disorder because of the patient's age of greater than 65 years old, um, presence of depressive symptoms, and low educational attainment. So there was noted progressive decline in cognitive functioning as noted by family members. And as um, later on, as documented by an objective rating scale with an MMSE score of mild cognitive impairment. So there was cognitive in, uh, there was impairment in doing activities of daily living based on objective rating scales and on the account of caregivers. So um, although at the time of evaluation, major neurocognitive disorder can be ruled out. However, it still warrants further investigation because studies have shown that cognitive impairment in depressed individuals could be a harbinger of schizophrenia, uh, of dementia. Also, depression may be one of the early signs of the um, depression may be one of the earliest signs of dementia. Hence, this warrants further investigation and monitoring. So, my for my final diagnosis, mm. major neuropol uh, major yes, doc. Uh, with regards to your differential, did you have a particular neurocognitive disorder in mind? Um, I was actually considering maybe the um, vascular dementia due to her um, uncontrolled hypertension. Po, doc. Okay. What about your presentation? Um, also, doc, uh, due to the forgetfulness and the difficulty in, in accomplishing tasks that she was able to do, um, do perform well previously, um, it could also be a dementia of the Alzheimer's type, doc, or it could be a mixed type of dementia. Okay, but uh, what about you, you? What feature would help you differentiate between the types of neurocognitive disorders? Um, maybe, doc, the the uh, um, the the. Um, onset of symptoms doc, in this for this patient okay, was um, the, the the onset of cognitive impairment was sudden doc, mm -hmm. on this patient doc. Okay. so um, and there was um, steady progress um, there was a steady decline over several months so okay. that could help in aiding for to if if there is major neurocognitive disorder that would be essential to differentiate between the different types. Okay, thank you. So um, for this patient, the goals of treatment are as follows. First is to achieve symptom control, especially the depressed mood and agitation, to rule out underlying medical illnesses, cognitive assessment, ensure patient safety, and also mobilize support. So for the initial consult, diagnostics were requested to rule out any underlying medical illness and to establish the patient's baseline um, uh, functioning of her organ systems. Also, it was planned to administer MOPA and MMSE to assess cognitive capacity. However, patient was becoming increasingly restless and uncooperative. Um, to address the depressed mood, um, esotalopram was started at, 10, at one half 
tablet for four days, then increased to one tablet thereafter. And to address the agitation and psychosis, risperidone was started at uh, 0.5 milligram per day. So in the treatment of depression in the elderly, according to the American Psychiatric Association guidelines for the treatment of depression across three age cohorts, um, it was recommended that a combination of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy as treatment for moderate to severe depression. So for the pharmacotherapy, the first line are still um, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake, reuptake inhibitors. For this patient, acetalopram was started, it is an SSRI and was shown to significantly improve depressive symptoms compared with placebo over eight weeks in depressed elderly patients in a study by Casper and colleagues. So also, psychosocial factors are frequent contributors to depression among older adults and should be addressed as part of the treatment plan. So for the psychosocial interventions, supporting psychotherapy was rendered to the daughter-in-law. Psychoeducation was done on the nature of patient's illness and the care warranted for her condition. Also, it was, um, it was uh, planned to conduct a family assessment and to explore further family conflicts and abuse. So before I proceed to the um, course in the ward, let me just discuss a little bit about depression in the elderly. So, uh, Dave, sorry. Yes, uh, uh, were, you, were you able to, to subject her for neuropsychological test? Actually, Doc, it was, um, I requested for it, Doc, uh, but it was parang for NPT once she was amenable. But the patient really, doc, um, at this point, doc, was not amenable for NPT. Do uh, we have a uh, no, uh, mini mental state examination? Um, uh, it was, I tried to administer MOCA and MMSE doc, um, during the first consult. However, doc, she was really uncooperative because she wanted to go home. Na po. So it was deferred. I was able to administer it on the second consult. Po, doc. Okay. Did you also have a rating scale for the suicide on this patient? Um, unfortunately, Doc, I wasn't able to rate objectively for the suicidality of this patient. Because mm -hmm. it's very common among elderly. Yes. Especially doc. in your in your history, uh, in your mental history and also your mental status exam, there, is, there was a suicidal ejections yes. and the prevalence rate of depression and suicide among elderly is very high, especially yes. among women. Yes. And I think it should be assessed uh, properly. Okay, yun lang. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, Doc. So, um, depression in the elderly is linked with morbidity, deteriorating physical health, the increased likelihood of suicide attempts, and social cognitive functioning. So, elderly people often don't display affective symptoms such as dysphoria, worthlessness, and guilt. So they are more likely to show cognitive changes as well as somatic symptoms of sleep disturbance, general loss of interest in daily living, and agitation. Older adults who experience an episode of depression earlier in life are more likely to have family history of mental illness. So what is the relationship between depression and dementia? Approximately half of the patients with late-onset depression have cognitive impairment. And the prevalence of depression in dementia patients has been reported to be between 9 and 68%. Depression has been proposed as both as a risk factor for dementia as well as a prodrome of dementia. So approximately half of the patients with late onset depression have generalized cognitive impairment. And it has become increasingly evident that cognitive impairment seen during or after the depressive episode is not pseudo, but perhaps a part of depression or a pre-dementia harbinger. So what are the features characteristic of pseudo-dementia? So if there is higher subjective cognitive complaint scores, complaints of difficulties with concentration and recent memory, there is poor effort on examination, such as in our patient. So she frequently provided with I don't know answers or refusal to do the um, task. And also there were inconsistency in se sequential functioning. So just to differentiate between depression, dementia, and delirium. So the, um, the onset duration could be, um, could be very helpful in the differentiating between the three disorders. And in depression, there is intact thinking but negative characterized by themes of helplessness as in our patient. 
So the memory impairment is selective or patchy, and there is least um, attention is least impaired, but easy, but uh, the patient could be easily distracted. Um, awareness is generally normal, alertness is normal, and usually there is early uh, morning awakening, and progression could be variable and uneven. So for my biopsychosocial formulation, we are presented with an elderly female widow with a history of abuse and was diagnosed to have major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So across the life cycle, it has been shown that females are more vulnerable to developing depression. Risk factors leading to the development of depression in the elderly likely comprise complex interaction among genetic vulnerabilities, cognitive diathesis, age-associated neurobiological changes, and stressful events. Biological risk factors for depression are particularly important in old age, largely because of age-related changes that makes them more common in older adults. It is well established that late-life depression frequently occurs in the context of medical illness. So in the case of our patient, she, she was diagnosed to have um, hypertension, which is a chronic illness. Although virtually any serious or chronic condition can produce a depressive reaction, the conditions believed to be most strongly associated with depression include cardiac and cerebro cerebrovascular disease and neurological, ne neurological conditions. Her long-standing uncontrolled hypertension is a biological predisposing factor to the development of depression. So it is also important to note that, that biological risk factors may interact with psychosocial factors as well as the depression itself. Lower socioeconomic status that has, has been associated with depression across the life cycle. And for many, physical, um, for, me, for many physical disorders, experiences related to the disorder, such as demands of managing a chronic illness, functional limitations, and vision or hearing loss can provoke a depressive reaction. So in the case of HA, her impaired visual acuity due to her cataract has caused her distress. Even after cataract extraction, there was only moderate improvement in her visual acuity. But despite this, she still continued to try her best to perform her usual task um, despite some difficulty because she wanted to continue helping her children and avoid being a burden to them. Also, her shared living arrangement with her suspected abuser, her son, and her live-in partner predisposed her to developing depression due to the continued exposure to abuse. Psychologically, HA is predisposed to developing depression due to her experiencing several losses earlier in her life. She grieved when, her, when she lost her first two children and doubted her ability to become a mother. She blamed herself for the death of her two children, and studies have found out that bereavement is associated with depressive symptoms in older adults and may be one of the most significant risk factors for depression in late life. And for, uh, fortunately for HA, at the time when she lost her two children, her husband's constant love and reassurance provided her the support she needed to get past the loss they experienced. Furthermore, HA's neurotic personality style as manifested by her being easily disturbed, tendency to worry excessively and being critical to herself and towards other people also predisposed her to developing depression. It has been shown that late life depression is strongly associated with neuroticism. Her neurotic personality strained her relationship with her children. As her children grew older, she also became they also became preoccupied with problems of their own. They became busy and HA was left on her own most of the time, except for Robert, who continued to live with his mother. Deficits in social support and negative aspects of the social network have also been considered as risk factors for depression in late life. Troubled relationships may be a factor in developing late life depression. Um, also, being widowed and perceived family criticism are contributing factors. Her husband, who was one of HA's constant support, has already died, leaving HA with a more limited um, source of support. Also, HA strained relationship with her children, who often dismissed her opinions and frustrations, made her feel spurned and lonely. Although older adults are less lonely than their younger or middle-aged counterparts, loneliness is as associated with depression in this age group. So when Robert was diagnosed with chronic illness, HA felt useless and hopeless. 
because she wasn't able to contribute to his son's medical care because of her limited financial resources as well as her physical limitations due to her old age. H.A. was also verbally abused by Robert and his leading partner, which worsened her, her already negative view of herself. Moreover, the family's gener generally negative attitude towards mental illness contributed to H.A. developing a depressive episode. Family members were dismissive of, of H.A.'s worries and sentiments about her son's condition, often telling her to, to, to just mind her own business because she was just adding to their already problematic situation. So according to Eric Erikson's theory of psychosocial development, older adults may become mistrustful, feel more guilt about not having the abilities to do what they once did, feel less competent compared with others, and lose a sense of identity as they become dependent on others. They also become increasingly isolated and may feel that they have less to offer society and individuals who successfully come to terms with these changes and adjustments in later life make headway towards developing integrity as manifested by having satisfaction and contentment with how the individual has lived her life. On the other hand, those who fail to have resolution at this stage may develop despair. H.A. experienced the loss of her two children earlier in life, which made her question her ability to become a mother. She was then unable to help Robert, and this triggered a new experience of loss and disappointment that steered up negative feelings toward herself. H.A. perceived her inability to help her as a failure of her role as a mother. H.A. has developed feelings of despair marked by feelings of low mood, hopelessness, sadness, and feelings of worthlessness, which ultimately lead to, dis to depression. At the biological level, the stress brought about by her son's illness activated the stress response and exposure to excessive stress caused the disruption of the homeostatic balance, leading to the activ activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Also, dysregulation in the serotonergic and noradrenergic systems led to the development of depressive and anxiety symptoms of persistent dysphoria, low motivation, decreased interest, hopelessness, difficulty in concentrating, and excessive guilt in HA. HA's condition is perpetuated by the continued activation of the HPA axis and sympathetic nervous system due to the continued presence of, of her stressors and invalidating environments. Evidence suggest, also suggests that nutritional deficiencies may play a role in the development and persistence of depression. HA had decreased appetite secondary to her depression and weight loss and frailty due to appetite disturbance can lead to compromised nutritional status therefore um, can also contribute to worsening of HA's functional impairment. The persistence of depressive and psychotic symptoms, as well as the cognitive impairment brought about by her symptoms, cause general functional impairment in HA. So her impaired functioning and increased dependency caused further strain in her already turbulent relationship with Robert and Cheryl. This made her even more vulnerable to being abused by them, which further perpetuated H.A.'s belief of being useless and failing in her role as a mother. Also, the negative attitude towards mental illness in her primary caregivers, sorry, in her primary caregivers and limited financial resources caused delay in consultation, hence contributing to the persistence of H.A. symptoms. Although Robert and Cheryl were dismissive of H.A.'s plight, Roldan and his wife were more positive, had more positive toward at attitudes towards the patient's mental illness and brought her to IPBM for evaluation. The recognition and prompt treatment for the major depressive episode can be considered a protective factor. And also, H.A.'s openness to discuss her problems can also be considered as a protective factor and this, can be late, advan this may be advantageous later on when she is amenable for a more exploratory type, type of psychotherapy. For the, the OPD, um, for her second consult, after um, she was seen after two weeks and in the interim, she was compliant to her medications as prescribed. She was able to tolerate the medications and untoward effects were no and no untoward effects were noted. So the patient stayed in her younger sister's house, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, who assist her in doing activities of daily living. 
So there was noted imp improvement in her sleep and she was also noted to be more relaxed and worried less about her about the police coming to arrest her. Also, she mentioned less about her son and her partner and his partner trying to harm her. And she was still afraid to be left alone and felt more at ease if she is able to see her daughter-in-law. So they sleep together at night because HA was noted to sleep more soundly if someone was beside her. After a week of taking the medications as prescribed, HA was already um, uh, able to do activities of daily living with minimal supervision. She was able to take a bath and eat on her own. She also began doing chores around her sister's house, such as sweeping the floor and washing her own underwear. So there was an incident when, when they were watching a movie, one character was having back pain and um, the patient believed that it was her son, Robert. So she kept on ruminating how useless she was. And the night before her second consult, she believed that Robert will be mauled because in, um, in the movie that that character that she believed that who believed was Robert was mauled. So um, on her second follow up, the patient was awake, conscious and not in respiratory distress. There were noted, uh, no noted rashes or lesions and um, she still had elevated blood pressure. So she was seen well groomed and look appropriate for her age. She was wearing pajamas and blouse. She was still anxious, but, but was noted to be more cooperative. She claimed to be sad and had appropriate tech. Her speech was more spontaneous and despite um, having a hesitant tone at the start of the interview, but she was able to warm up um, later on in the interview. And she had also good um, concentration, but was still noted to have fair eye contact and stoop to posture. She denied having auditory hallucinations, but still believes that police are after her because she, because she has seen. When asked about what her offense might be, she refused to elaborate. She was oriented to person, place, and time, and added that um, the only problem is she has no FM pass. When asked about um, where she is, when asked about where she is, so patients still refuse to do serial subtraction and spelling, and memory and judgment were unimpaired and um, patient has no insight to her condition. Uh, for them, um, this time, I was able to administer the MMSE. She scored 23, um, which is indicative of mild cognitive impairment. And also geriatric depression scale, um, she scored 14, 14, which is suggestive of depression. So um, during the first consult, uh, it was part of the plan to conduct a family assessment. So um, the, the, um, the following slides are the results of the family assessment based on my interview with the daughter-in-law, the granddaughter, and the patient, and also the, um, one of her sons. So um, with regards to the knowledge and attitudes of family members towards the patient condition. So when Robert fell ill, her children understood that HA was worried about Robert's condition. However, as months passed by, they frequently dismissed her concerns about Robert's health because they were also preoccupied with problems of their own. So when HA started to manifest symptoms of depression and, difficult, and um, difficulty sleeping, Roldan and Roger decided to bring their mother to a doctor wherein she was prescribed with clonazepam. So as her condition worsened and HA started to have more disruptive symptoms and disorganized behavior, and also um, delusional beliefs of someone trying to arrest her or thinking that she, her food was prepared using dirty water, Roger and Robert's family became exasperated. Because of this, they frequently dismissed her, their mother's behavior as part of her worrying excessively and being particular about cleanliness. Roldan and his wife, on the other hand, remained concerned about HE's condition and brought her to IPBM for consult. The sources of social support are as follows. So the eldest son, Roger, um, is a part uh, is a small time construct construction a contractor for um, construction projects. So he is dismissive of the patient's condition and has problematic alcohol use. He also has unstable income in, and is unable to fully commit to the patient's care. Raudan, her second son, is a taxi driver, showed concern about patient's condition and was receptive of the psychoeducation about the nature of the patient's illness. His wife helped with taking care of the patient while her husband was working, and um, uh, Rodan and his family has a more stable income. Robert, her youngest son, was, is currently unemployed, so he is also dismissive of the patient's chronic illness and has, 
uh, dismissive of the patient's illness and also is a, uh, also has a chronic illness himself and is undergoing regular hemodialysis. So he is currently unemployed and is abusive towards his mother. The partner is also abusive towards the patient. Maria, um, the patient's younger, younger sister, is already retired and relies on her pension. She only has one child who is working abroad. She, she expressed concern about the patient's condition but is hesitant to commit fully to patient's care also due to her old age. Um, for the family conflict, abuse, and legal issues, so Robert and his living partner were noted to be abusive towards HA. The couple frequently argued with the patient over their gambling habits despite their unstable income. Also, the couple relied heavily on HA in doing household chores and taking care of their children, but showed little to no gratitude towards the effort made by the patient. HA on HA's other children expressed concern over the couple's behavior and advised HA to kick them out of the house, but HA refused to do so. So Robert and Rodan, who were also living in the same compound, tried to confront their mother, uh, their brother Robert, about his behavior. So sorry, it was Roger and Rodan, but to no avail. Robert was preoccupied. Uh, Roger was preoccupied with his work and also had problematic alcohol use. Hence, he did not pay much attention to his brother's uh, behavior. Roldan, on the other hand, confronted his brother about his, treat, uh, his and his live-in partner's treatment of their mother. And when Roldan witnessed how Robert and Cheryl treated H.A., he confronted the couple and warned them that he will get his mother should they continue treating her badly. When Roldan noticed that H.A. had several bruises on different parts of her body, he confronted Robert and Cheryl about it, warning them that um, should something bad happen to their mother, he will make sure that they will get in prison. Robert retaliated by threatening to kill Roldan and his wife, and Roldan and his wife filed a police report, police, uh, report to document the incident, but decided against filing formal charges for now. So Henry, who was working abroad, grew tired of being caught up in the middle of the arguments between his brothers. He decided to stop sending money for now, and all, he also wanted that should his brothers continue to fight over money, he would permanently stop sending money for his mother. So at this point, the diagnosis is um, still major depressive disorder with psychotic features to consider pseudodementia of, of depression versus major neurocognitive disorder, hypertension stage 2 poorly controlled, status post cataract extraction, and suspected elder physical abuse. For the diagnosis, okay. yes, but Ah, okay, you're on that. Proceed. Sorry. Okay. So for the diagnostics, a um, uh, plain cranial CT scan was requested. So uh, the results of the previous laboratory examinations that were requested were essentially normal, except for the twelve lead, uh, for the chest uh, twelve lead ECG and the chest X ray results, which showed um, sinus rhythm and left ventricular hypertrophy. And for this chest X-ray, um, atheromatous aorta, but this could be attributed to the patient's um, long-standing hypertension. Escitalopram was continued and risperidone was continued because um, the patient showed improvement with these um, medications. And um, psychoeducation was done to the daughter-in-law and supportive psychotherapy was rendered to the patient and the daughter-in-law. So, um, it was also planned to conduct neuropsychological testing once the patient is amenable and they were advised to come back after a month. Uh, question lang, so, Davy. Yes, I have a question first. Yes, oh, oh, yes. Why yes, CT scan? Why did you consider CT scan over MRI? Um, actually, Doc, um, because of the limited... Ideally, Doc, MRI would be a better choice. But the, due to the limited financial resources of this family, um, CT scan was requested though, to at least um, have an imaging study that could rule out any undetected or um, yeah, undetected um, lesions or um, cerebrovascular accidents in the brain that could also contribute to the patient's symptoms. Though. Yes, you're right. MRI is more sensitive, no? Yes, to uh, yes. I know, for strokes, mini strokes, and other 
blood vessel abnormalities. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you, po, Doc. So for the third, um, two weeks before her scheduled follow-up for her third consult, Roger and Robert confronted Rodan about his wife and HA state. So Roger accused Robert. Uh, I Roger and Robert accused Roldan and his wife of only taking care of HA because they are after the money that Henry will send for their mother. Roldan and his wife were offended by their accusations because they have not asked for money for HA's medications and daily needs except to pay for the laboratory examinations requested by the physician. Roldan talked to his eldest brother to settle the matter and to avoid further discord within the family. So Roldan pointed out to Roger that H.A. cannot go back to her house because Robert and his living partner might insult or hurt their mother again. Also, Robert is undergoing dialysis three times a week and has, two, and has three young children. It might be difficult for him to look after their mother and Roger and Roldan agreed that H.A. will be transferring to Roger's house. However, H.A. only stayed in Roger's house for two days because Robert contended that she should go back to her house and insisted that he will be able to take care of her. Roger readily allowed his mother to go back to her house, much to Roldan's dismay. According to Roldan, Roger just wants to be rid of the responsibility of taking care of their mother and was more interested in having drinking sessions with his friends. So to avoid further conflicts, Roldan did not contest his brother's decisions, but warned that he will be keeping a watchful eye. In the interim, H.A. was noted to not bathe regularly and sleep on the patio at night. When Roldan confronted his brother about this, Robert just dismissed him and said, H.A. was often left alone in the house because Robert and his wife had to go out for his dialysis sessions three times a week. She was left alone with Robert's young children and was expected to take care of them. Roger did, um, did not visit his mother because he was preoccupied with matters of his own. There were also instances that H.A. herself would go to Roldan's house and ask for food, claiming that she has not eaten for days. Whenever she would go to Roldan's house, her daughter-in-law would bathe her H.A. and make sure that she was well-fed. However, they had to bring H.A. back to her house to avoid conflicts with um, other children. Three days prior to her scheduled follow-up, Roldan was on his way to work when he noticed his mother had bruises on her arms. He immediately asked what happened, um, to which the patient replied, Gibunda ko ni Cheryl sa cemento. And according to H.A., Cheryl and Robert forced her to take a bath and gets mad when she takes long to finish her food. They would often grab her by the arms and physically hurt her. Kulatahon ko nila sila Robert o Cheryl. This infuriated Roldan and leading to confront leading him to confront Robert and told him to advise his sleeping partner not to harm their mother in any way. He also gave a stern warning that should this happen again, he would take his mother back and he does not care what his brothers would think of him. In retaliation, Robert went inside Roldan's house wielding a knife and threatened to kill Roldan's family if they interfered with their mother's care again. Police had to be called in to calm Robert down and Roldan and his wife filed a police report but opted not to file formal charges for now out of pity for his medical condition and young children. So for the third consult, H.A. came in accompanied by her daughter-in-law and one of her granddaughters, um, the one of um, Roger, the eldest son's uh, daughter. So the patient was awake, conscious, and not in um, cardiorespiratory distress. So there was noted weight loss of approximately 2.5 kilograms. So her previous weight was 43.6 kilograms, which was just last month. And after a month, it was 41.4 kilos. Two kilos in one month, no? Two yes, 2.5 kilos. Po do. Okay. And um, there were noted multiple contusions on bilateral upper extremities, left pectoral area, and ventral portion of the right lower leg as shown in the figure on the left. And there were no gait abnormalities and focal neurologic deficits noted. She was well-groomed, looked appropriate for her age, and was still seen wearing white shirt and pink pajamas. She looked more frail compared to her previous consult, and she was visibly anxious again, especially when her daughter-in-law was out of her sight. 
So the patient verbalized that she feels sad and hopeless as she has no money to help her son. She showed appropriate affect and she spoke spontaneously, sometimes in a hesitant tone, especially when asked about details regarding her, um, her bruises, wherein she said, Gikulat ako sa akong anak o sa iyang asawa na si Cheryl. So before she was able to answer this, she was noted to glance at the at her granddaughter and she she just whispered this to me. Um, she was seemingly afraid that her granddaughter would hear what she said. There was noted persecutory delusion. She claimed that um, she lived in the marshland and that she would be arrested by the police because um, she has seen HE also noted to have poor attention and had avoidant gaze. She avoided looking directly at her granddaughter and the interviewer and would only look at her daughter-in-law. She denied having auditory hallucinations, but still believes that the police were after her because she has committed um, uh, a sin and an offense. And when asked what her offense might be, she still refused to elaborate. Passive suicidal ideation was noted when H.A. verbalized that she wants to die, but she not aff cannot afford to do so because their family might fall apart. She was uncooperative to the rest of the MST because she was worried about having uh, to pay more money for her consultation. Also, she insisted that she already needs to go home because nobody will take care of her grandchildren. So, so for this um, consult, um, the... the Diagnosis was still the same, but now um, there is a diagnosis of suspected elder physical abuse. So the patient for the diagnostic, the patient is still for NPP once amenable and was still for plain cranial CT scan. So they were unable to facilitate plain cranial CT scan because the care of the patient was now transferred to the other siblings. So she was not in under the custody of Roldan and his wife, who were the first um who were the, initial, the original um, companions of the patient when she came in. So, uh, um, question? Yes, but doc. Oh, oh. Yes, Kasi but doc. you are still considering suspected elderly abuse. Yes, is it doc. Is it not evident in your history? Okay, doc, there is. It's evident. It is. Yes. It is evident. Uh -oh. Doc. Oh. Uh -oh. Kasi if you're uh, suspecting, wala ka pang gagawin, di ba? Yes, doc. So you have to act. Okay? Yes, doc. Because in your history, it's really abuse. Yes, doc. Diba? doc. Na yun lang comment ko. Doc. So for the pharmacotherapy, medications were continued, and for the psychosocial intervention, um, psychoeducation was rendered to the granddaughter about the nature of the patient's illness and the level of care warranted, because um, they were dismissed. She was very dismissive about the patient's symptoms. She just attributed it to the patient being particular about cleanliness. Na parang limpiada lang. That's why she was acting the way she was acting and or behaving. And then supportive psychotherapy was rendered to the patient. She was reassured that the hospital is a safe place for her and she does not need to pay more. She was also referred to the social services to coordinate with local um, social worker to conduct a welfare check on the patient and also to conduct, uh, to have a social case study report submitted to us. She was also referred to SPMC Trauma ER for evaluation of multiple contusions. And for close monitoring, um, they were advised to follow up after a week. So uh, unfortunately for this patient though, um, after the detection of the physical injuries, the patient was not brought back for follow up already. So this patient was lost to follow up. No. So all the more now you have to communicate with the social worker. Yes. Because the abuse is really ito to do yun, no? Yes. So yes. Uh, action, immediate action should be done to keep her safe. Mm -hmm. So following this doc, um, we wrote a letter to the city social services to ask for a social case study report, which would indicate the family composition the source of the um, possible caregivers and the description of the event and what are their professional recommendations on the care of the patient. Actually, Doc, um, I just received their reply <laughs> two days ago. Um, uh, last week, the daughter-in-law communicated with me 
that there was an incident where the patient was locked in the CR and was grabbed using a towel, grabbed by the neck using a towel and was locked into the CR because she refused to take a mask. And in the social case study report submitted to me, um, the social worker um, wrote here that the client had mood swings that the care caregivers cannot control. So her children decided to put her mother in the comfort room and other areas where she can be alone and safe from sharp materials or other harmful things. So, and um, their justification for the bruises found on the patient was she frequently bumped on the doors and the walls and other areas of the house, which contributed to her injuries. But the pattern of injuries does, um, is more in the, um, it's as if parang someone grabbed her by the arm because the bruises were circumferential around the area of the arm. So, you know, uh, on the end of the social services, look, um, that was their conclusion, that was their report. And they forwarded the concern to the barangay officials so for case conference. And there was there is no update regarding that as of the moment. Look. So it's somehow frustrating look, na, that that, that, their, that was their conclusion, doc. But at the same time, um, as I will be discussing early, uh, later, the there are limitations to our roles as the as the psychiatrist in cases of elder abuse. Uh, did, you, yes, did you Did you refer her to an ano parang elderly care na ano facility? Uh, is there a government no? Home no, care, because no. uh oh, and coordinating the social worker. I asked our social services about that doc if the patient could be temporarily sheltered in a government facility to ensure safety. However, doc, their stand on it was since the patient has um um like anak has living children who are capable of taking care of her, they will not intervene doc. Pero it is obvious na, na may abuse. So yes, hindi no, pwedeng walang intervention yun, no? I yes, think no. also you need to educate them and maybe uh, ano, um, find ano para mga uh, ano yun, mga evidences or ano Look, to, actually, wala, I, uh, uh -oh. I documented the ano, I documented the um, I had a picture of the injuries, Doc. I, I, I documented it. And uh, also the medical certificate from trauma ER. And also, Doc, the daughter-in-law recorded um, how uh, Robert and Cheryl would talk to the patient and how they would treat her. So uh, there were actually recordings. But um, Roldan and... Uh, his wife are hesitant to take legal action dogma because they are also uh, um, they are also they also do not want to cause conflict among the compound because they live in the same compound and Rob and Robert has already they they fear for their lives also dog because Robert also threatened to kill them already at least once so that's their conflict also. Um, can I continue, Pudo? So, oh, please proceed. So, elder abuse, um, as defined by the World Health Organization, is a single or repeated act or even lack of appropriate action that occurs within any family relationship where there is an expectation of trust which causes harm or distress to an older person. So, abusers are most often in the position of trust, so this can be children and other family members. And among those who experience abuse, only 2% report their cases to the authorities. And around 11% turn to their families for support, while 21% sought no support or refuge. So um, only 4% of elder case of elder abuse is reported. So why? Because older people Maybe. may fear... Yes, Doc? Can you summarize for us the oh, pertinent okay. for your patient? Thank you. Okay. So in elderly individuals, they may 
um, not report abuse due to fear of retaliation, worry about getting the abuser in trouble, be mentally incapable, and feel ashamed or embarrassed. So um, forms of abuse, uh, abuse may take forms in such as physical abuse, psychological or emotional abuse, sexual abuse, financial exploitation, and neglect or abandonment. In our case, the patient experienced physical, psychological, or emotional abuse, financial exploitation, and neglect or abandonment. So um, elder abuse can lead to physical injuries. And for older people, these consequences can be especially serious and convalescence may take longer. So um, these are the Maybe. risk factors. How yes, about but... you, uh, can we go to how to uh, manage or what, uh, what's our step as physicians? Okay, for Doc. So I'll proceed na lang. So this is just um, risk factors for elder physical, elder abuse. So the role of the psychiatrist in cases of suspected elderly abuse. So in the um, for psychiatrists and other mental health professionals in particular have crucial roles in assessment of the mental functioning of the patient as well uh, uh, that, that forms the basis for determining capacity and for evaluating the consequences of abuse. So psychiatrists must be particularly attentive to issues of confidentiality and conflict of interest in the assessment and treatment of elderly patients who may have uh, been abused. So these are the steps that we need to take when we encounter suspected um, abuse in the elderly. So first, we must identify suspected elder abuse. So recognizing mistreatment is often difficult because direct questioning about the abuse may not be helpful as older individuals may be unable to provide information because of cognitive impairment. And also the history is sometimes difficult to obtain from the victim for fear of retaliation by the abuser. So in exploring the basis for unexplained physical injury or emotional distress, elements of abuse may become apparent and increase about financial habits and status may reveal other areas of concern. So for our patient, about, Davey, um, mm -hmm. what, what were you able to pick up that made you suspect elder um, abuse? Aside go. from the patient's uh, um, dito, uh, verbal, verbalization. Verbalization, the physical injuries, though. And also, doc, the um, the report of the the daughter-in-law, and the ano do, um the, the development of the depressive episode, which led to um global impairment, global functional impairment in the patient. Do. Okay. So we should conduct comprehensive geriatric M M MSP. We should um. Uh, assess cognitive impairment if there is cognitive impairment, the presence of mood disturbance or thought disorder, and elements of executive function should be evaluated. So deficits in this area also typically precede the other cognitive losses in incipient dementia, such as memory. So there should be thorough the documentation. Um, documentation of all findings may be entered as evidence in criminal trials or guardianship hearings. So there should be careful collection of physical evidence, which is critical in cases of suspected sexual or physical abuse. Did you collaborate this, uh, Davy? With uh, did you co collaborate with <clears throat> WCPU? Yes, doc. I actually doc. doc ma, when I learned about the physical abuse, I the first thing that I did was call WCPU to refer this patient. However, doc, um, according to the WCPU, doc, they only catered to intimate partner violence, doc and not these types of abuse. So, so I opted to refer na lang doc to SPMCER to document the physical injuries and advise the family that um, to also be um, file a police report. Was this document documented na? And then um, did you also uh, inform ER of what your findings were? Yes, doc. I referred okay, this patient to the ER. And that's very well, important. Yes, doc, because um, um, they, we had two options at that time, doc. Um, when we found out about the physical injuries, it was either to bring the patient to SPMCER, but um, they could also they also had the option to bring the patient to the city health office because we also have um, forensic uh, medical legal examiners there. So the, the initially the family was hesitant to bring the patient to SPMC due to fear of COVID, but later on decided that um, it would be easier if they just bring the patient there. So um, the patient was referred to SPMCER. And um, next is, we should avoid providing a forensic assessment for a patient under our care. So whenever possible, avoid ethical conflicts. So the requirement for objectivity 
may conflict with a therapeutic relationship and such a forensic report is likely to compromise the patient. So this um this is discussed um in and repeatedly discussed in our forensic um, diagnostics. So capacity standards differ for different tasks and um, it should be tailored to what task is being assessed, the capacity for which task is assessed for. So, okay. so um, on your end, you are the not the evaluator, but not the, the evaluator. Okay. The and therapeutic the, panel. Yes. Okay. So and okay. then for the management of elder mistreatment, it involves discussing the situation with the patient if visible. And the patient should be allowed to play a role in the ultimate resolution. And competency of the patient should be determined. So um, um, local and state social services have different methods of addressing mistreatment, but it's gen generally recommended that a multidisciplinary approach could be should be done because it is very effective. And um, also senior advocacy volunteer groups may also be helpful. So uh, we should also report. So as psychiatrists, we are obliged to report when elder abuse is is suspected or identified. And failure to report is a lapse not only in ethical obligations, but also has legal implications. So in the Philippines, the, currently there is no specific or dedicated legislation on the prevention of elder abuse, nor the provision of support services and access to redress for victims. Um, elderly women in family environments and intimate relationships can be protected under RA 9262 or the Anti-Violence um, anti Against Women and Children Act of 2003. And also the Section 33 of RA 9710 or states that um, the state shall protect women and senior citizens from neglect, abandonment, domestic violence, abuse, exploitation, and discrimination. So toward this end, the state shall ensure special protective mechanisms and support services against violence sexual abuse, exploitation, and discrimination of older women. However, such prote protection... And um, recently, though, last year, House Bill 7030 was proposed. It was uh, termed the Anti-Elder Abuse Act. So this is more specific to elder abuse. So under this bill, it, def it, um, it defines elder abuse and prescribed penalties for offenders. So under the bill, the senior citizen shall have the following rights in addition to those privileges... Um, already provided in the existing laws. So and we go, Davy, to the management okay. again. <laughs> and so, so the bill mandates okay. LGs to... So call. relating this to our patient, so what's relate, our goal mm, now? Relating this to our patient, though, um, on our end, uh, as, as the psychiatrist uh, who is treating the patient, so um, we refer this case to the social services. So that uh, they would be coordinating with the local um, social worker and have them um, give a feedback to us. So unfortunately, um, so far their feedback is, um, as stated earlier, that the, um, they find no uh, grounds to suspect abuse in this patient. And forwarded the case to the barangay for family conferencing. Okay. And um, so it was so forwarded that, naman. Yeah. Meron namang yeah. ano, action. Yes, doc. Okay. Yes, okay. Doc. And so far, doc, um, the family conference is yet to be conducted. And so there is a reporting system developed by the social um, Department of Social Welfare and Development. So with respect, it is being implemented in some areas in Davao region. However, Davao City has not implemented this yet. So to end my presentation, um, to care for those who once cared for us is one of the greatest things. So let us take care of our elderly. Thank you. And good Thank you. Um, and any comments from our consultant? Comment, uh, yes. Dave, maybe yes. what can be done in this case is you can invite, a, you can coordinate a multi-sectoral meeting because mm -hmm. it seems that the assessment of the social worker, though we don't really have control of their assessment, however, during the meeting, at least, Mandang, you can... Um, Help them understand, no? Uh, help them understand of your assessment. And at the same time, you can enlighten them that because their assessment is just that uh, it's the patient's mood symptoms that triggers the behavior of the children. Maybe we, you can help them understand that uh, the, the family has an option, no? To to change the caregiver or the care provider to the child who is more understanding to the patient's condition. In this case, that is uh, young, uh, the, the family who frequently uh, accompanies the patient's uh, OPD. Yes. And also, uh, 
you can help them understand that uh, uh, some family dynamics can trigger a particular symptom sa patient that makes the di patient difficult to handle. Yes. Para, uh, para they can also think na parang uh, letting the patient stay in the abuser's uh, household uh, is not the only choice. Yes, doc. No, kasi ini-impose kasi ng abuser that the patient should stay there. Yes. Uh, another is because the patient really insists to stay with the abuser. So yung role ng psychiatrist to really establish the capacity, i-establish mo yun. Uh, right now, what does the 